welcome back to part two of this conversation with the Honorable Locke Faircloth. Tell us uh, about your experience when you took over commerce. There was literally nothing in the state going on. We reorganized state government with Jeb Hunt went in. And we put 16 agencies, some of them very small, but from ABC stores to economic development, welcome centers, travel and tourism, welcome centers, all that I put under commerce. 16 agencies, I say some of them were very small, but some of them were pretty big. And we put all that under commerce. But economic development was the principal function of commerce. So when we look at economic development and some of the things you did there, I recall reading somewhere where General Motors was at one time thinking about coming to North Carolina. The labor unions were a big concern for North Carolina because North Carolina was attracting industry because they didn't particularly favor the labor unions. But I recall reading somewhere where you took a trip uh, and went to see the, the folks in very high levels with General Motors. Can you yes, tell us about that? They were l looking at a factory in the Piedmont section and they were planning on it, but uh, they were trying to move away from the unions and they were totally unionized, but North Carolina was totally non-union and they were thinking about establishing their first non-union plant. And uh, they had moved pretty far into it, but the UAW, United Automobile Workers, just went mad. They, they and uh, that if they put a plant in North Carolina, they were gonna close down every other plant in the country. And they were just couldn't do it. And General Motors back down. Of course, today, North Carolina is absolutely full of non-union automobile plants. In fact, I don't know that there's a unionized automobile plant in the state. And not only the state, but Tennessee and Georgia and all over. They're all non-union now. As you look at where we are now with our economic development in North Carolina and look at where you've been, and you've been in a key position in economic development, what is one of the most important things you think of as it relates to economic development for North Carolina, for the region? What, what advice would you give? Well, I would have to say to continue the position the states had on non-union, of insisting on non-union plants. You can look how we have grown in the last 40 to 50 years as one of the top industrial states in the nation because of the non-union and the vast amount of industry that's moved here. And at one time, the state was almost totally unionized. When I think about, and I want to change gears a little bit, but when I think about your career, I've also got to think about how important roads were in your career. And as commissioner, looking at the roads for the state of North Carolina, particularly for one of the regions that you looked at, which included North Carolina, Wilmington, uh, particularly uh, Sampson County, Brunswick County, there was a, a huge area there. Uh, give us a picture of what you saw when you took over that job and what resulted as a result of you being there? Well, when I took over, we had an enormous amount of secondary roads. Uh, I don't know, maybe 60,000 miles. It was, uh, they had been built during the Car Scott era with the one cent gasoline tax. And, but the, so the secondary road system was excellent, but we did not have a primary road system. It had 
fallen to nothing. It was a disaster. And then the interstate, the Congress passed the interstate road system, and the interstates took a lot of the pressure off of the state money so we could build secondary roads because we didn't have to build some of the major primary roads, such as, uh, well, I-95 from Virginia to South Carolina, I-70 to Tennessee. Uh, this took enormous pressure off the state to, uh, so it gave us money that we could build primary roads, but not the interstate. When we took the interstate off into the federal, it gave us an enormous amount of money to improve the primary system with, and city streets. At, at one time, uh, Brunswick County was in bankruptcy. Tell us about that. Well, it was right, right strange. I, I was young and new, and the first county commissioner's meeting to discuss roads I went to, there was this man in a suit that sat over and said nothing, and I didn't ask him anything, and he let the county commissioners talk, and before they would vote, they would turn to him and ask him if they could vote for it or against it. Well, I, the first meeting, I let it slide. I just figured he was a local politician and strong, but then the next meeting I went to, the same man was there and the same thing transpired. And I asked him, I, and I asked him, I said, what is your role? He said, oh, he, I'm sorry, I should have explained. He said, Brunswick County is in bankruptcy and I'm trustee for the bank. And we have to approve everything that they spend any money on. And they've been in bankruptcy for about 15, 20 years. And they're trying to pay it off, but they are very much in bankruptcy and we're the trustees. That's, uh, that's probably shocking when folks hear that because a lot of people could not imagine that today knowing the wealth that is in Brunswick County. But Brunswick County was in bankruptcy and uh, the Wachovia Bank was trustee. Well, if, if in the role of highway commissioner, you were able to not only oversee, but ensure that a lot of the roads that were paved in this area, in the 18 county viewing area that this will this show is seen on, those roads would not have been there most likely had you not been in that position. Well, yes and no. We, we paved and built a lot of roads, but we had a, a, a lot of carryover from the Car Scott. A lot of secondary roads were built, and a lot of these secondary roads that were built then were very poorly built. They were just a little strip of asphalt on sand, and we had to rebuild a lot of them. So we rebuilt a lot of secondary roads. What do you recall as, as probably uh, one of your number, if, that you would have to say from, from where you sat in that time period as one of your biggest accomplishments as, as commissioner, highway commissioner? Upgrading a lot of roads that were, as we called them, Car Scott roads, mm -hmm. into not primary but secondary highways, roads you could travel on. And I, I think of 242 uh, going down. Uh, we rebuilt 701, we rebuilt 421. So the rebuilding of, uh, some of them were secondary roads, some of them were not, but we built them all to primary. Fast forward to today, and you've seen this occurring over the years, Highway 24. 
a big effort has been made and Highway 24 is in the process of being four laned. Now, as it approaches towns, uh, Rollsboro, some of these other towns, in some areas, it's bypassing those small towns. Yeah. Uh, is it correct in, in your assumption that in moving traffic, and I, I think I'm reading my history right, uh, you were a proponent of supporting bypassing some of these towns so traffic could move through. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you, you have to realize that we pay gasoline tax for the primary road system and the secondary, but the primary road system's primary job is to move traffic from city to city. Now we've got the inter the road drill the roads in the city. We use uh, another tax, but the primary purpose of the highway system of the primary highway system is to move traffic from city to city. Then you have your secondary road system and an urban system or city streets to handle the inner city traffic. And you've got to realize that, say this rebuilding of 24, that's not a five year job or to last, that road will be there for the next at least 80 to 100 years. The 24 that's there now is 85 years old. So this one will be that old or longer. Hindsight, hindsight being 2020 and thinking about Highway 24, as you look at it now, one of the original plans on Highway 24 was to put two clover leaves and 24 would bypass Clinton. Do you think there was a mistake made in running Highway 24 down through the existing road bed and bypassing Clinton? You could teach that either way you want to. You bypass a town, you've devastated the local business, and uh, it really never comes back. Uh, from the standpoint of moving traffic, yes, it should have been bypassed. From the standpoint of the economy of Sampson County and Clinton, no, it's exactly where it should be. How were you able to take some of those business experiences and put them into effect in a government setting. Was that hard to do? Was there a pushback? Not really. Uh, I guess there was some pushback, but by the time I got into the highway, running the highway commission, most people had become aware and cognizant that the highway system was primary for economic development and local development, economic development, but business development within the towns, that without it you just would die. So there was great support for the highway system and opening it up to the towns. I want to switch now to your stepping into the political world. Uh, and one of the things that, that you had decided you wanted to do was run for governor of North Carolina, and you were running on the Democrat ticket. Yeah. You were running in a primary. What did, um, what kind of drove you to wanting to be governor of North Carolina and stepping into that arena? Because that was kind of another level of government. Just talk to us about well, what uh, you were thinking, the thought process going through with that. Of course, it was probably the ultimate in conceit. But I felt that uh, government could be run a lot better than it was. And uh, I ran for governor in a primary against Rufus Edmonston. And I knew I could do a better job than Rufus. 
Well, if he sees this, I, we'll just... <laughs> well, Rufus can see it. Yeah. And then... Uh, but we had a mean, mean primary. Mm -hmm. Rufus beat me in the primary, and Jim Martin beat, beat him in the general election. Okay. Which was a Republican governor coming in, which is very unusual for the state of North Carolina. It was the first one in a long, long time Jim Martin was. Okay, so, so we're moving forward uh, from your bid to be governor. That, as you just said, didn't work out. There was this, uh, a lot of change started to occur. You were looking at the United States Senate, but a fellow by the name of Terry Sanford was involved in that. During that time, you decided that this is something I want to do. And tell us about what you were thinking and the decision process of saying, well, I'm going to do this, and you switched. You switched parties. You went from Democrat to Republican. Did you talk to somebody about that? Was that just something you said, if I got to do this, this is a strategy I got to use? I didn't really talk to anybody. It was something I decided to do. Sanford and I had talked in 1956. Uh, we had, were longtime good friends and were until his death. But uh, in 1956, I had thought about running for the Senate. And, and you know, s said I might. And mm -hmm. Sanford came to me and said his age was working on him. And he would wanted to run for the Senate and always had. And he only wanted to serve one term. And that if I would back off of the Senate race and let him serve one term. Well, Sanford and I were very close for a long time. So I said, sure. Well, about five years into his term, I was kind of gearing up a little bit to run for the Senate, as we had discussed. Well, he announced that it bothered me a little bit, that he had decided that he had so many projects going on in the Senate that he needed another term. And uh, he called me and he said, I know what I told you but I just feel like I could be so valuable to the state by serving another term. I said, Terry, that's totally beside the point. That's not what we agreed on. He says, well, that's true, but like you know, I can beat you in a Democrat primary hands down. Mm -hmm. I says, you're absolutely right, Terry. But let me tell you something. I'll clobber you in a general election running as a Republican. And that was a conversation between you and Terry Sanford. So he says, I don't believe you're going to switch. I says, absolutely, I'm going to switch. In fact, I'm going to do it today. Now, this was in 1990. You'd been a Democrat for 40 years, right? Longer than that, all my life. So how, how, did, how were you received by the Republican Party switching and stepping in? Uh, did you get the support? Generally very, very supportive. Uh, very supportive. Uh, I'm sure there were many that didn't express their true feelings, and a few did, that they didn't need me in the Republican Party. But uh, I told them they did need me in the Republican Party, and I ran. And Sue Myrick from Charlotte. From Charlotte was the old time Republican that was supposed to be the candidate. And I was another one. But anyway, it was going to be a real mean primary. And uh but it wasn't a mean primary at all. 
that wasn't even a runoff. I won the thing hands down first time. Now, when, when you ran for Senate, that's a very expensive operation. Yeah. The, the it published there was some numbers published of your own personal assets that you put into that campaign. Was was that something that you had uh, a lot of trouble processing, or did you just all of a sudden say, "I'm going to do this and I'm going to pay for part of it"? When I decided to run for the Senate, I decided to do what I had to do to run. Actually, I. I was very lucky. Uh, I raised 70% of the money was contributed. Which was a great asset, which showed people the yeah. support you had. Well, the, and uh, see, there was a big switch of Republicans glad to see some new blood in the party, and they supported me big. And surprisingly, a lot of the wealthy conservative business Democrats that I had worked with in economic development and many things came forth and were big supporters in the Republican election. One of the things, uh, kind of, and I'll call it a theme, a theme uh, for, of the Republican Party has uh, been the idea of less government, more business, cutting spending, some of those things that you ran on. Yeah. Did you find a comfort zone more for Locke Faircloth as a Republican as opposed to a Democrat? Did the principles of the Republican Party fit you better once you switched and, and saw that? Yes, I did. But the Democrat Party began to move to the left in the, in the 50s even to appeal to a more socialistic uh, welfare-type government. The, the party made big moves in that direction. So the Democratic Party had left me as much as I left it. Now, when you went to Washington, D.C., uh, Senator, you, you came from a, a rural state. You walked into a uh, a town that had its own reputation, whatever that was, but uh, but there has there's some articles that were printed that talked about you as a farmer in in, in Washington D.C. and talked about some of the uh, committees that you were on and and some of the things that were printed was not very tasteful because uh, there was a mayor in Washington D.C. at the time that uh, had been arrested for some drugs and he was still mayor and. Uh, and uh, I don't want to get into name calling, but there was a little clash of philosophies there. Tell us about that because it's been in, it's been in the media. It was in the media back yeah, then. But there was a tremendous clash. It wasn't a little. Uh, I was chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, and as such, as chairman of that committee. I had the city of Washington under me. What most people do not realize, and it's gone back now, but that the city of Washington is totally controlled by the Congress. That the fact that they have a mayor and a city council is the acquiescence of the Congress. They, every year they, meet and say, you go ahead and have you a mayor and a city government. You have the blessings of the Senate to do it. But it has to be, the Senate has to acquiesce to give its blessings for the city of Washington to have a mayor and a city council. It's under the Senate. So when I saw the absolute fiasco that Marion Barry had created in Washington, and it was just that. It was, it was unbelievable. He, he had uh, 16,000 people on welfare. So when I just took one look at it, and as head of the D.C. District of Columbia Committee, I said, we got to change it. 
So I simply did away with the Washington city government. I said, you no longer have a city government. We're going to put it back under the Senate. And that was almost like an explosion in the paper because Marion Barry at the time, in fact, he was under some legal Oh, he situation. was always under legal drugs. He, he was under something all the time. But I said, no, we aren't going to run the capital of this country in the fiasco that we've had in the past. So there's no longer a Washington city government. And I appointed a committee of senators to be the council and run the city. And they hired city, independent city managers, a professional manager to run the city. I want to fast forward. I, I know you, you are a voracious reader. You read all the time. You, you read everything. So I want to get your feeling now for where we are because We've, we've seen almost a reverse in 98 when not, in 1998 there was a kind of a takeover of the Democrat Party with the Senate. Now we see in where we are right now at this day and time, the D Republicans have obviously taken over the Senate and in control of the House. What does the Republican Party and the people in those seats as senators need to understand that is important for them to do from your perspective as a former senator and as a businessman? They need to bring a more realistic and business approach back to government. We simply are spending money at a rate we cannot afford as a country to keep borrowing and spending. We are driving the country into an ultimate bankruptcy because there is a limit regardless of how much wealth that you can continue to borrow and spend. And we've got to stop. There are some articles, and I'm sure you've seen some of these that have been uh, written that talks about there's a sense that there may be those that would like to develop a huge number of the electorate that was dependent on government so they could control those people and ensure their positions in government. Uh, is there any validity to that thought process? No, I can't believe that there is. I, I, can't, I can't believe that there's people that want to see government employees and people dependent upon government giveaways to run the government. I can't believe that there's, that there's anybody that wants to believe that. Uh, somebody's got, the government is supported by taxes from independent business people and working people. And they're the ones that are paying the bills. So you, you I just can't believe that anybody is foolish enough to believe that government should be an entity within itself and control. I can't believe that the people, government, should control the government, that the government needs to be controlled by the citizens, not the people in government. Absolutely. Because it goes against the philosophy of capitalism to think that that would even work. Well, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, who's going to pay the bills? Somebody's got to work to make the money to run the government. Well, I, th I think we're in a, uh, hopefully in a learning curve and the right things will be gone, uh, done going forward. There, there is, as we have been talking, as you indicated a while ago, an extreme left and an extreme right. Are we in a state of thinking we need to think more moderate in our approach and what we're doing? I think we are. We need to think uh, to, to bring government under a more business-oriented approach. And that would be more moderate. But I think there's no question this, this country and government at all levels need to be brought under a business-like approach. We can't run it with unlimited taxation of the people. Who's paying the taxes? The business people, the working people. 
And if you strangle them, the whole thing goes down. So you have to, uh, the taxation has to be in line with the government income and government programs and policies have to be in compliance and in line with the income from taxes. I want to I want to move to um, a question, and I'll start with your background as a statesman, as a senator, as a politician, and working in various levels of government. I want to look at three aspects of your life, and I want to ask um, maybe one or two questions about those three aspects. And of course, the first one is the arena of government. What do you consider one of your uh, proudest points? in your experience in government, either as a senator, highway commission, whatever that service may be, what would be one or two of the, the most things you want people to remember Lot Faircloth about when they think about you 10, 20 years from now? I dare say the economic development as a Secretary of Commerce, and in the Senate, we, uh, I put a lot of effort and interest and state money into economic development. We, we have had tremendous growth and experience in the economy and the development of the state not only in, in industry, but in agriculture uh, because of state support and programs. We have done everything possible. I did, and I will probably self-praise as half scandal, but I started it of expanding business and growth with the help of the state. The, the other part of that question, which is the opposite end, when you look at that life of Lot Faircloth as the senator, as the economic developer, as the roads uh, builder, what would you do over if you had a do over? I would have switched parties earlier and brought a more conservative approach to government. We went on too long with a tax and spend government, and I was part of it for a while. But it, I would uh, support a more conservative government with less taxes. What is one of the highest points, one of the things you're most proud of as a businessman? It was one of my best business moves. I started to say smart, but it wasn't smart at all. It was dumb luck. In 1990, 89, I had eight automobile dealerships, and I sold them all and kept the real estate. And the automobile business said 91, three and two and three and four just went absolutely into the pits from General Motors going into bankruptcy to Ford almost closing and Chrysler and GM both in bankruptcy. So the automobile industry was tough. So you stepped out at the right time, but retained the real estate, and that was the asset. Yeah. And we're talking millions of dollars. Well, we're talking on some money. <laughs> but uh, but I, had, I had eight dealerships, and I kept all the real estate. We'll call it good decision making. Yeah, that was a good decision. Uh, the same thought process with business. What would you do over when you look back at your business career? What, what would you change or tweak or do a little bit different? I would say that if you could back up 30 years, uh, farmland would have been your best investment. But I have had a lot of luck with other investments and post offices and 
that type of shopping centers, and I've had a lot of luck with them. And, and when I hear you talk about your life as a businessman, I hear that a big part of that life and the success has been your ability to simply make a decision. A lot of folks sit on the sidelines, won't make the decision, but you've always been in the game. Well, I've never had a problem making a decision. Now, they were not always good ones, but I've never had a problem making one. I want to move you to that third part of the life of uh, Locke Faircloth, Duncan McLaughlin Faircloth, your personal life. What's the, when you look at it and you think about your marriages, you think about your daughter, grandchildren, any of those things, what's the, the thing that, that gives you more of a sense of, of pride, of, of warmth, of, of feeling that in 10, 20 years somebody will look back and they'll hear you talk about this and, and say, wow. This is about your, your life, your family, things that's close to you. My daughter, I, I am enormously proud of Anne. She has been a, just a perfect daughter to me. She's never created a problem for me or anyone else that I'm aware of. And uh, she could have gone anywhere in the world to live, literally. Uh, she could have gone anywhere to live, uh, Paris, Los Angeles, or New York, and she chose Clinton. And I'm, uh, and she's very much interested in, well, she runs the business totally and completely now. I have practically nothing, I have nothing to do with it. Do you at times sit back and look at Ann and see lot fair cloth traits in Ann? Well, if I do, I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> I, <laughs> because her mother was a shrewd and smart businesswoman, and Ann got much of her mother's characteristics, fortunately. Absolutely. And, and I hear you talk, when I hear you talk about Ann, I feel a sense of warmth there and closeness uh, that, that is felt by a lot of fathers and, and siblings and children. Well, she has certainly been a wonderful daughter and still is, and uh, we have a good relationship right on today. And In fact, I don't know the term I want to use. But uh, it's, I can't ever remember having a significant disagreement with Ann. Okay, let's um, move to that same area in your personal life. If you had a do-over, God says to Locke Faircloth, personal life, you can do one thing over again. What would that do-over be? Maybe start earlier, have more children. Interesting response. Interesting response. I, I was going to say uh, you definitely wouldn't want to do over Ann because obviously she's, she's done a great job. So you would like to have more children at, at where you're at in life? Yes. Uh, I, I, I think I would. Okay. That's a hard decision to make because... You don't Ann, ever know. But. Ann has been a, a wonderful asset two or three more could have been a disaster so been. so I with the experience I've had with Ann as a daughter I would like to have more but I'm well aware that uh, more might be in trouble if if you had to look at parents as we sit here today uh, in uh, 2014 on a beautiful day in the fall of the year, and you would say to parents some things that they need to know about nurturing and raising children from a father's perspective. A lot of folks know 
Senator Lot Faircloth, from a statesman, from a businessman, um, from somebody that has made a lot of good decisions. Give us some fatherly advice from Lot Faircloth that a lot of folks may never have thought about asking you that question. Well, I, I'm getting into an area that I am far from qualified to start giving advice in. But if uh, if if I had to see that what I've seen with other people and children where that have been very successful with their children is to uh, as early on as possible give the children a lot of leeway and let them begin to develop their own course. Don't be too stern. Don't, don't try to discipline and over control your children. Interesting, interesting. And this is kind of the last area. I, I know we're going to take a break here. We're going, I'm going to let you uh, kind of relax because I, I, I understand that time-wise, I'm not going to put you through this too long, but I, I want to get into the spiritual part of, of uh, Lot Faircloth. I know that you were very close uh, to a minister by the name of Bill Hawkins. In fact, uh, you had him in the Senate to deliver the prayer for the opening of Senate. And I, I listened to him pray. I saw your reaction. Tell us about the spiritual self of Lot well, Faircloth. Well, Hawkins was certainly a good friend and a great minister, and I guess he's still a minister. But of course, the minister that I grew up with and was here for 30 years was M.C. McQueen. And I was young when he came to Clinton, I, I think he came about, I'm going to make a guess, 36, 7, sometime in then. I would have been a young eight or nine year old boy. So I grew up under Mr. McQueen, and he was here for close to 30 years. So my youth and early and young adulthood was under M.C. McQueen. He as was a unbelievably fine man. He was from South Carolina and Dillard, in fact, and he understood the people of Clinton. Would you say, uh, you're, uh, I told me a while ago, you're 87 years old now. Would you consider yourself um, a spiritually inclined Christian person and how has that affected your life over the years? Well, number one, I think when people start describing their Christianity, they're getting way beyond what they know or even should be talking about. Uh, I've been a member and was christened in Grace Memorial Presbyterian Church when I was about 10 or 20 weeks old as a baby, young baby. And I've been a member of the church ever since and gone through the many changes that I've seen in the church, but uh, as far as I, I've always considered uh, religion or its attributes a very personal and a very uh, non-public part of your life. A good answer. I, th I think one of the, the reasons I wanted to ask that question, there seems to be uh, we're at a place in society now that there's, it, it's, it's almost um, 
should should I say not appropriate to mention Christianity in public places there there are those that would say well you shouldn't pray before a board meeting and and those kinds of things it is the conversation and I wanted folks to I want folks to to know what your feeling is at 87 years old with the journey that you have gone through well I don't have any problem whatsoever of course with uh, public display of Christianity. But I think a personal display of it is, uh, tends to be a little pompous. Good answer, thank you, thank you. And I wanna, one thing I wanna clear up, and I think we might have mentioned this before, and I've, I've said your full name a couple of times and I've had a reason for doing that, Duncan McLaughlin Faircloth. How did the lock, McLaughlin, how did, the lock, because a lot of people mix that up, and they will call you Lot as L-O-T and not Lock, L-A-U-C-H, as a nickname. Was that a nickname given to you by your family or your parents, or did you pick that up early on? Well, no, I didn't pick it. Uh, when I was, uh, I was named for my grandfather and great-grandfather. Mm -hmm going on back, Duncan McLaughlin. Duncan McLaughlin Fairclough. Well, there wasn't a fact Duncan McLaughlin was my maternal grandfather. Right. So uh, I was named for him and uh, my mother somewhat insisted that I was going to be called Lachlan and it didn't take country children long to cut Lachlan to Lock. They took the MC off and the L-I-N and ended up with Lock, L-A-U-C-H. There are a number of people that had Lachlan. Mr. Bethune, Lachlan Bethune, here in Clinton was Mr. Lock Bethune. There were, there were, it, it is, it's not a common name, but there are a few around. I want, I want to just read something to you. You tell me if this is correct, and then I've got one closing question, and, uh, and, and I'm going to close out. But Duncan McLaughlin Faircloth, uh, of course, you were a United States senator. You were born uh, in Sampson County in 1928, January 14. You attended Roseboro High School in Sampson County. Uh, you were involved. Attended Concord Grammar School. Concord Grammar School. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were involved in farming, commercial real estate, heavy construction, auto dealerships, chairman of the North Carolina Highway Commission. Ready mix concrete. Ready mix concrete. And a lot of plants. Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Commerce. Uh, you were elected uh, as a Republican to the Senate in 1992. Well, I was chairman of the State Highway Commission and Commerce. Chairman of the Highway uh, Commission. All of these things that we've talked about, is there one person that stands out in your mind that you would say was somewhat of a role model or you learned more from than any other person? Oh. Car Scott was a tough, straightforward man and a superb politician, but never got into any of the oily or the seamy side of politics. He kept it on a high plane. Car Scott, he did a lot of good things for the state and the road system that he sponsored and had built gave this uh, state a big leap economically from its farm economy to its industrial economy. 
about industrial plants came to the state because of easy access of labor to the plant. Their employees, because of the road system we had, could travel 10 or 12 miles and work in the plant and go home and maintain a rural aspect of life. And they did not have to live in a congested cotton mill type town. They could live 10 miles or 15 from the plant and, and have it maintain a rural lifestyle and a plant work ethic. And now you were, uh, as we've talked about in a previous discussion, you were uh, chauffeured literally, Carl Scott, drove him around the state at some point. I traveled a lot with him. So you got to know him very well on a personal basis. Now, I recall reading somewhere where he continued to encourage you to go to college that he thought that you would do great and could just soar through college. Is that correct? Was that information correct? Well, no. No, not, I traveled, Carr Scott appointed Frank Porter Graham mm -hmm. to the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Graham had to run for re-election pretty soon after he was appointed. So I think it might have been Terry Sanford, I'm not sure who, but I got selected to travel with Dr. Graham for about a year in his campaign. Now, Dr. Graham was a wonderful man, brilliant man, but a politician he wasn't. And they thought I could be of some help to him traveling around the state with him, and I did that. And Dr. Graham maybe was the one that also encouraged you to? To go to college. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. So he was the one that, that was a, a jump. No, it wasn't Carr Scott, it was Dr. Frank Porter Graham. Dr. Graham, okay. Well, it, this, is, this conversation has been done in two parts. And uh, of course, where we are now, um, it, we're kind of coming to closure here. And the last thing is, is there anything you would like to add to this? Because we're hoping that once this is edited and put together, that it's part of the archive of uh, Duncan McLaughlin Faircloth. And I want to just give you the opportunity, anything that you want to kind of make sure that's part of this archive going forward, for, we, we'll say for the next generation. Well, no, I do not. Uh, that's probably too much going forward to the next generations. They might choke on what they got now. <laughs> you, might have, you might already have too much. Thank you for being with us for this two-part conversation about the journey of one United States Senator, the Honorable Lot Faircloth from the great state of North Carolina.